Our guest today is uh, Pat Harker, president of the University of Delaware, and we're going to speak to him about the challenges facing uh, higher education. Pat, thank you so much for joining us today at Knowledge at Wharton. Al oh, Mukul, it's great to be here. So uh, you've written this really thought-provoking paper, uh, and I wonder if we could start by looking at the costs of higher education mm -hmm. and, and why they seem to be soaring. Uh, is university education a good investment today? Yes, it's still a good investment, but a lot of people are now questioning it, right? After the recession that we've gone through, people are coming out with $100,000 in debt. They may not have the job, a job at all, or it's, they're underemployed. And so there's a lot of questioning. The, the evidence still says it's, it's worth it. But you can understand why people are questioning this today. So what are some of the main factors that are driving costs up and, the, uh, uh, and what have universities done to try and curb them? Well, there's a lot of factors, but if you look at the main factor, it's low labor productivity as defined by an economist. I have to be careful. When I say this to a faculty member, they say, hey, I'm productive. What do you mean? <laughs> so I have to say it's defined by an economist. And this goes back to Will Balmol's idea that he published in 1967, Balmol's Cost Disease. Economies have sectors that have low labor productivity, high labor productivity. On average, inflation is a mix of those. But the ones who have low labor productivity will always have inflation higher than the average. Right. So, so uh, when we talk about productivity uh, in, in most industries, uh, information technology often factors into the picture. Uh, do you have a sense of what the impact of uh, innovation, uh, information technology has been on education? Sure. But let me step back and not talk about education, but think about healthcare. So we in higher education are not unlike healthcare in that we've consumed a lot of technology to improve quality, but not really with an eye to reducing cost until recently, right? I mean, once uh, in, the healthcare reaches 25% of GDP, people are starting to say, whoa, let's, let's think about this and we need to reduce cost. We've done the same thing in higher education. We've put in new projectors, new technology, but we've really not fundamentally changed the way we educate. And that, I think, is the key, that technology alone is not going to solve the productivity problem. Technology enables new processes, and those new processes will then deliver lower cost, higher quality. What might be some examples of that? Of lower cost, higher quality? Mm -hmm. I think what we're starting to see emerge are things like MOOCs. So MOOCs can play a part of the role there. We're starting to see a lot more problem-based learning, interactive learning, where students are learning by doing, not by being lectured to. The old days, and you think about, forget information technology, the way we tried to improve productivity in the past was to build 300-person lecture halls, right? That does improve labor productivity. Whether it improves learning is really the question I raised in the paper, that we've developed very efficient teaching machines. And that is, that's okay if teaching equals learning, but it doesn't, and it increasingly doesn't in this generation that is technology enabled. And that's what we need to try to break. And there are examples, lots of examples, of people experimenting with new learning modalities, not necessarily new teaching modalities. And I think there is a difference, and it's a fundamental difference. Right. Uh, and and I'd come back in a minute to uh, you know the difference between teaching and learning. But I'd go back. I'd like to go back to your paper for a minute, uh, where, where you write, "There is both hope and fear that IT innovations will end the university as we know it." And why why is that? Sure. So Clay Christensen with Disruptive Innovation has been talking a lot about this in the case of higher education, that the incumbent institutions, us, uh, we think everything's fine. And for those who are heavily endowed, it probably is for a while. But for those who are not, there are a lot of forces that are changing the market. First, the demographic decline in the United States, so the college age cohort that we traditionally service is in decline. We're also seeing more first generation, lower income students coming into higher education. So we can't charge what we used to charge. And we also are now seeing, in addition to all those forces, we're starting to see the world wake up to higher education, building new campuses in China, building new campuses in India. And so the flow to the U.S. is starting to change as well. So all that's gotten universities to start to think about, well, gee, how do we become more productive? 
Right. And, and, and one of the things you suggest in the paper is to shift the emphasis from teaching uh, to learning. Right. And, and I wonder if we can talk about how the design of, of the educational institutions can be changed so that the emphasis is more on the learner than on the teacher. So let me give you a very specific example. We opened up a new science building last summer. And it's all based, all the classrooms are based around the concept of problem-based learning. The classrooms are 48-seat classrooms with two 24-seat labs on either side. Students walk in for two-hour sessions. They're learning some mix of biology and chemistry. They don't know if it's biology. They don't know if it's chemistry. What they know is there are problems they're trying to solve that are related to biology and chemistry. They work out the hypotheses, immediately get out of their seats, go into the laboratory, and start to test solutions to the problems that were presented in the class, and then come back. Very interactive, very different than, say, the chemistry you and I took in college, where we took a 300-person lecture, and then later in the week we took a lab, and the lab sometimes made no sense with respect to the lecture, and we were supposed to figure it out. Problem-based learning changes all that. That was an efficient way to teach, right? Have the 300-person lecture and the laboratory separate. This is really learner-centric, really saying what's the most efficient way for students to learn that science and make it sticky, right? That not only did they learn it, but they're not cramming it. It stays with them because they discovered it themselves. Right. And, and, and so do you think universities will be able to use these kinds of techniques so that they're no longer teaching factories, as you call them? Yes. I think what, the only way to do that, though, is to take the material that is commodity, can be commodified, right? In other words, it can be packaged up, simple stuff, basic calculus, basic concepts, and use other tools, whether it's a MOOC or, frankly, you can go to old school technology, a traditional textbook, and do competency-based testing on those things, students learning on their own, and using class time in a much more active manner than we do today. Right. So as we think about uh, these changes that are required in education, are there any lessons to be learned from other service industries? Oh, sure, sure. I mean, one is there's always the great hope that technology is going to save us all. Right. And it's not true. Again, go, go back to robotic surgery. Lots of evidence has come out in the last uh, few years that, in, except for very few cases, the robotic surgery for many different disease types is no more efficient than a traditional laparoscopic surgery with a surgeon's hands, but try to be a hospital today without the robot. So sometimes we just consume technology with no real benefit. So we need to learn that. We also need to learn that, again, it comes back to changing processes, the way we do things. I mean, it's standard when new technology comes in that we try to lay technology on old processes. Think of banking. I mean, there used to be great fights in the banking industry, which I studied extensively when I was here at Wharton, that the the ATMs and the internet banking was going to destroy the bank because everything was about the branch. And everybody's focus was, well, it'll destroy the branch. We can't let that happen. Well, think about the analog in higher education. All these new technologies are going to destroy the traditional classroom. No, it's just going to change what you do in that classroom, just like internet banking and ATMs changed what you did in the, bra in the branch. Right. So, I, one of the concepts that you explain in your paper is uh, customer efficiency. Right. Uh, I wonder if we could uh, explain what exactly that is and how it will change education. Sure. So if you think about services, unlike manufacturing, when you bought your Toyota or your Honda, you didn't screw the bolts on the car. Right. You bought the car, you drive it. The difference with a service, any kind of service, professional service, healthcare, education, is that the consumer is part of the production process, right? They're in there making it with you, right? If the consumer doesn't take their health seriously, there's nothing a doctor can do. If a student doesn't take their education seriously, there's really nothing a professor can do. So it's really focused on not making the system efficient from our perspective, the provider, but making the system efficient from the customer or student's perspective so that they can be very effective in providing their own education, because ultimately they have to educate themselves. We just don't pour knowledge into their heads. So if, the, if technology is just a tool, why have so many educational institutions almost made it the be-all and end-all of innovation in education? 
Yeah, but again, if you, th you think outside of education, lots of industries have gone through this transformation, right? Where technology is going to revolutionize everything, they realize it flopped, then they get around to really rethinking the processes. We got a lot of legacy concepts running around in our head about what works and what doesn't. And so I don't think we're any different than any other industry, particularly any other service industry. We're in the process of this transformation. Some of that transformation, frankly, is being fueled by forces outside of higher education. Another major force, or outside of traditional higher education, is the fact that the venture capital flow into the higher education space is increasing rapidly because they see an opportunity here. Remember, it's not just the U.S. Around the world, the middle class is emerging. The first thing the middle class around the world wants is to educate their children. And the traditional campuses, we can't build them fast enough or big enough to, to educate in the traditional way. And they see that opportunity, and we as the traditional higher education institutions also need to think about that opportunity. Because part of our mission is to serve that global market. So what role does the design of the curriculum play in this transformation? And, and, and uh, to, to go one step further, traditionally, it's educational institutions that have defined what the curriculum should be. In a learner-centric environment, what role should the learner play in designing yeah, the curriculum? That's a very good question. To start with my, my old colleague, Bob Zemsky, who here at the Graduate School of Education at Penn. Now, in his recent book, Checklist for Change, he says it's all about the curriculum. It is. So you think about the curriculum. It's really the design. It's really, it really constrains what you can do. So imagine the following scenario. You're working at, say, oh, Apple, and your boss comes in, and you're part of a product development team, and they say, we need the next big thing. Well, what's the price point for it? We don't know. That would never happen. They'd have to know at least what kind of costs we're talking about for the product that they want to deliver. Think about how the curricula are developed in universities. Faculty committees come up with ideas. They toss them over to the administration, and they say, make it so. And without any concept of what that's going to cost, that's all, that also has to change. What do you mean by ideation, uh, large frame pattern recognition, and complex communication? Yeah, so in a recent book from colleagues at MIT, The Second Machine Age, they talk about the fact that the machines keep coming, right? right? And Luddites, um, notwithstanding, we're not going to stop it anytime soon. So they ask the question, what do human beings do today and in the foreseeable future better than computing technology? And they come up with three things. Ideation, truly new creative thinking. Not just combining ideas, which a machine can do. Take a little of this, a little of that, come up with a new idea. But truly new ideas. If you are, out of the box ideas, right? The second is large frame or large scale pattern recognition. So machines can do a lot of pattern recognition, but putting together technical, social, political, economic, cultural factors and to try to come up with a solution to an issue, that's hard. That's what we, we human beings do. And the third is complex communication. Machines are getting better and better at communicating. But still, I'd still put for high-end sales a human being in front of another human being to sell because they read the nuances, the nonverbal communications. It's those things that are very important for students to learn. And you have to ask yourself then, what percentage of our curricula are devoted to those? Probably not much. And we then have to think about that in redesigning the curriculum for the future. Well, there's, there's uh, one other part of your paper that I found really fascinating, which is uh, uh, deals with whether educational institutions should encourage students to dream. Uh, how and uh, why and how uh, should that happen? So if faculty time is being used in a teaching factory, I'll call it, where we're just crunching classes through, and no time's being used to help students, faculty mentoring, helping, guiding students, then the faculty really can't help that student dream because they're so focused on the production engine of just teaching the classes. And this changes people's lives. I would not be doing what I do today if it wasn't for a faculty member, John Lepore, who passed away recently in civil engineering at this university, who took me under his wing in my junior year and gave me a chance to do research. 
I never even knew that was a, an opportunity that was available to me. He opened up my world. He helped me to dream in a very different way. That's what I, I talk about in this paper is freeing up the time to do the basic. Get, the basics can be done in other ways, enabled by technology. And really changing the model so that faculty are spending more of their time on that kind of coaching, the mentoring, the dreaming with the students. You know, uh, as, as the education space goes through all these changes, you referred earlier to the you know, entry of uh, more and more venture capital into this place. Uh, there are some very interesting startups that are trying to deal with the same issues that uh, you know, the big established institutions are trying to grapple with. And one of them is Minerva. Right. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about Minerva, what its model is, what its successes and failures might have been so far, and what lessons that might have for other schools to learn from. So Minerva's a startup. It's started by a fellow, Ben Nelson, who's a Wharton undergrad alum. Uh, I, in full disclosure, I'm on his advisory board along with uh, several others, including uh, Larry Summers and Lee Shulman and Bob Carey, the former senator. But it's really Ben that's been driving this. And he has Steve Koslin, the former dean of social sciences at Harvard, who's now joined him. And Steve, being a cognitive scientist, has really developed a learning platform based on the what we know about cognition, about learning. We don't learn by sitting in a classroom half asleep. We learn by active engagement, active learning. So the whole model is based around that. There are physical campuses where students will live, but their classroom will be their laptop with 18 other students where they can't take a break for 45 minutes. They're engaged for 45 minutes in a very deep way. So they're bringing in their pilot class to San Francisco this year to shake out the, the software, uh, they have four classes they're teaching. Minerva has part competency-based, so they have, students will need to graduate with competency in two languages other than their native tongue. University won't teach that. They're Rosetta Stone, there are other tools out there to do that. They're gonna spend their time on those issues we talked about earlier, ideation, large frame pattern recognition and communication. Four classes, formal reasoning, empirical reasoning, uh, complex systems, so how all those factors intersect, and multimodal communication, critical reading, critical writing. Notice it's a heavy dose of the liberal arts, but not packaged in the way we typically do the liberal arts, but it's helping students to really think critically. What impact do you think these kinds of models will have on the, will they truly succeed in disrupting the existing educational establishment? They could. Um, you know, not only disrupt, maybe not the traditional educational establishment as much as take up the growth that's going to be happening around the world. Right. Because if this model is more successful, we can't build a lot of pens. It's very expensive to build a university like this. The Minerva model is scalable and scalable to serve that growing need around the world. Uh, should universities consider outsourcing services to one another and what implications might that have? Yeah, that's a good question. So we've been outsourcing for a long time, right? Textbook manufacturers still package up PowerPoint slides with their textbook. They give instructors manuals with problems. There are a lot of faculty around the world that just take the PowerPoint slides and the instructors manuals and deliver the course. A MOOC is just a modern version of that. But there's various forms of outsourcing. So you could do that, or you could actually outsource to a third party, like, for example, Minerva's doing, to teach language, the basics of language, to a Rosetta Stone or like companies. There's another form of outsourcing, though, that I really worry about. One of our missions, particularly as research universities, is not only to generate knowledge, but to sustain it, to protect it, to pass it on to future generations. Well, some fields are cyclical, right? When I was a student here at this university in the 80s, Lot in the 70s, a lot of interest in Russian. Right. Not so much in the 90s and 2000s. Now it's actually coming back. And so we need to maintain that capability. But it's hard to do if you're a university administrator and you've got three to four students in a class studying Russian. But why don't you use technology in a very simple way to create virtual classrooms and consortia of universities to gather, say in this case, all the other Ivies to teach low enrollment. So we, instead of having three, four people, we have three times eight in the classroom. And now we can afford to keep that alive. I think that form of outsourcing has not really been done much. 
there are places where it's been done, and it's been done very successfully. So clearly, as, as we've discussed, there's a, a huge amount of change that is required in higher education. Who do you think are going to be the primary change agents who will drive this change? Well, the faculty have to believe in the change. Because but don't again, they have the most to lose? Well, that's a good question. They might, or they also have the most to gain, right? Oh, it, depends yeah. how, <laughs> right? it depends on how you look at it. Right. And so I know, for example, several faculty who have gotten deeply immersed in MOOCs, the Massive Open Online Courses. And I asked one of them once, uh, who was visiting our campus, I said, why are you doing it? He's a friend of mine. And he said, this is the future, and I want to get ready for the future. So not all faculty are going to do it. But they, like anything, they're going to be early adopters, ones who see what the future looks like, and they want to be part of it. You don't need a lot. You just need a few to create the skunk works, the experimental lab, to, to prove the concept. And I have one final question. If you look five or ten years out, what changes do you see on the horizon uh, for higher education? Uh, what kind of action plans do you see universities having to put in place? And if you're optimistic or pessimistic, uh, what are the reasons for that? I'll start with the optimism and pessimism on both. It depends on where you stand. <laughs> so, I mean, if you are a small college uh, that, or a state university, non-research state university, we're already seeing Moody's, S&P is downgrading the debt of these institutions saying you're not going to survive. So there's concern. So if I was sitting there, I'd be very concerned uh, that either I can, can I change quickly enough to make it. Uh, I think for universities that are currently strong and robust, uh, like, like any industry, the winner-take-all society does tend to exist. So for those, if they do the right things, if they seize the opportunities that are in front of them, if they seize the opportunities to change, which is a very hard thing to do, right? We as human beings don't like change fundamentally. Uh, then they will do very well. Otherwise, they may join the others in decline. And that's what I worry about. Because in the end of the day, the higher education system in this country is the gem, or one of the gems, of the United States of America. And higher education is critical to economic development and growth all around the world. We've got to get this right. Thanks so much, Pat. Really appreciate your speaking to Knowledge at Wharton. Thanks, Michael.